Hi, this is part two of a general introduction to robotics, originally prepared for final year undergraduate students shortly after Stanley won the 2005 DARPA Challenge for Autonomous Guided Vehicles. Part one included a potted history of some important milestones in the development of the topic as well as pushing the idea of robotics as an alternative approach to investigating how living things work, not by taking them apart and analysing the bits, but by building up lifelike imitations. This part introduces some of the challenges facing modern roboteers to set the scene for our later study, and starting with locomotion. Robots have been built to match just about any way of getting around imaginable on land, sea or air. The brachiator here, for example, swings ape-like through the trees, an interesting but somewhat unlikely way to beat the rush hour. Submersibles are particularly popular for exploration and remote working in a hostile environment. And all manner of unmanned aerial vehicles are ideal for surveillance, although flapping birds, going back to Architas, are a bit inefficient at present, but a fascinating imitation study. And finally, there's a lot of work going on in reconfigurable designs where basic modules can organise themselves into appropriate forms for the task in hand. Not exactly like slime mould or smart organic cellular systems, say. The form, or architecture, of the robot control system, or brain, is an even more important consideration than the physical forms employed by robots imitating animal and human behaviour. This slide outlines some basic approaches. The deliberative paradigm is based on an internalised model of the world through which the robot plans its actions, and which is updated by received sensor data. Whereas the reactive approach leaves out the model and directly links sensor inputs to output action. And the hybrid paradigm adds a planning model back on top of the reactive approach. Firstly, looking at the deliberative approach, this is derived from Albus's work on intelligence and hangs around the model of the world. It was used for several NASA and DARPA automated systems as well as a shaky robot introduced in part one. And shaky didn't work so well at the time, owing to the huge amount of information required for a workable and sufficiently complete world model, and the data processing overheads in its use, since at every step the incoming sensor data has to be integrated into the model to plan the next action before it can move. Observation of simple creatures like cockroaches that react directly to stimuli but yet can do complex and often very annoying things with only a few neurons, led Rodney Brooks of MIT to propose the SenseAct or reactive robotics approach. He observed that while an internal model of the world will be incomplete and inaccurate, the world itself can be used as its own model. And this is Rodney Brooks with two of his reactive robots, Cardia, based on the Segway, and Cog, seen here trying to grab an apple. The key to reactive behaviour is a direct and fast link between sensor data inputs and output actions through atomic modules of behaviour like see food, eat it, see tyrannosaur, climb tree and wait for it to become extinct, and so on. This chimes with animal ethology schema theory, the reptilian brain, four Fs, food, flight, fight and reproduction, and Skinner box psychology, as well as neatly fitting into an object-oriented software model. The problem then is how to integrate all of these individual behaviours into a functional robot. And strategies to do this include subsumption and potential fields. In the subsumption approach, individual behaviours are switched on or suppressed by links from lower or higher behaviours in the hierarchy. In this example, a higher level behaviour like reverse can take over from a lower level one like move forwards to avoid a possible collision on the other hand, the potential fields approach merges the different behaviours together by adding up their individual action fields. 
So a chase me field from a prey target, say, may interact with a run for it field from a nearby predator. Here, in the slide, the green obstruction creates a repulsive field, while the red target has an attractive one, leading to the least potential route shown. The reactive approach will leap forward in robot functionality and emphasize the advantages of starting simple, imitating cockroaches rather than human beings. But maps can be very useful for finding the way around. While well, using the world as its own model means that reactive robots are restricted to the messy business of leaving trails of breadcrumbs. Hybrid schemes were therefore developed to combine the rapid response and computational simplicity of the reactive architecture for basic world interactions, along with the navigation and mission planning advantages of the deliberative approach. This matches with the idea of robots' higher-level rationality being relegated to background planning tasks, and then mostly idling, while the reactive components get on with day-to-day -day activities. This seems to be plausible too for human rationality, which may also unfortunately have the onerous uh, additional task of making up justifications for actions or preferences dictated by the reactive reptilian parts of the brain. In this example, higher level deliberative functions include mapping, navigation, mission planning and sequencing. The reactive layer still has a direct sensor to actuator links for fast response, with behaviours in this case running in parallel and merged together by potential fields. It's only if the reactive layer fails to progress that an upwards call is made to the deliberative layer for emergency planning. And an additional unit here is the homeostatic layer that straddles both areas and is responsible for moderating reactive behaviours in response to mission requirements. Navigation is another big challenge. It can be classified into separate problems like how do I get there, where have I been and where am I? The kidnap robot problem refers to the situation where a robot trundling along minding its own business is set on and bundled into the back of a van, blindfolded and driven to some remote location where it's set free. This might seem unlikely, but a wise robot should perhaps be prepared just in case it's ever taken out of a cardboard box and asked to vacuum an unfamiliar flat. SLAM is this combined problem of finding a way around an unknown environment while building up a map that can then be used to facilitate such a task. To navigate, the robot must establish its position and relationship with the environment through sensors. This slide shows some of the common sensors used in robotics along with their major characteristics. A dormitory features sensors like shaft encoders to measure wheel rotation and speed and hence distance travelled from a known starting point. It's cheap, available and fast, but errors due to factors such as wheel slip increase without limit. Inertial sensors include gyroscopes and accelerometers to measure rotational and translational motion also from a known starting position. They are widely used and found in many devices, ships, planes and rockets, but drift errors can again accumulate without limit. Ships and planes have long used beacon systems of which GPS is now the standard. It's based on trilateration, the intersection of timed radio paths from three or more known satellite positions. GPS is great for outdoor localization, but its signals aren't too good indoors. It measures absolute position, but it updates relatively slowly and is subject to random timing and atmospheric delay errors, a mere 3 nanoseconds time shift giving a position error of around 1 meter. Indoor applications mostly use ranging ultrasonic and infrared sensors, which give short-range target distance information from reflected pulses. LiDAR, laser radar, is good, if expensive, for ranging and 3D imaging, and is increasingly used for autonomous vehicles, along with conventional radar to measure following distances. Cameras are also being increasingly used as object detection and tracking improves. However, robots at present have a relative lack of dependence on vision, the main high-resolution sentry system for most living things, owing to the challenges of developing efficient processing strategies and the computing power to implement them in real time. This slide makes the point that any sensing system exists in Plato's cave and only sees a small reflection of the real world out there.
whatever that is. Trying to compute an accurate model from this data is technically an impossible task, although living things do it well enough most of the time, and so may some oracles. This slide shows a possible navigation strategy involving a variety of sensors. Ranging sensors like LiDAR or ultrasonics can be used to detect and avoid obstacles. Quick movements can be tracked using dead reckoning methods as the data is always available, while slower GPS type sensors are used to correct for long-term drift. Data fusion techniques may be used to combine information from different sensors to obtain the best estimate of the situation. Since all measurements have errors, combining the evidence from different sensors is done using Bayesian statistics with implementations like the Calvin filter. For example, in the SLAM problem, a vehicle with a known kinematic model and a sensor capable of taking relative measurements of surrounding features starts at an unknown position and moves through an unknown environment. The objective is to localize the vehicle and at the same time build an incremental navigation map of the observed features. A common filter can be used to combine the observations with the robot model. The algorithms converge as the observations increase to localize the robot with respect to the features and to identify the features relative to each other. This is a somewhat dodgy and certainly skippable attempt to show how the Kalman filter works. If you perform a physics experiment, say to measure the way voltage depends on current flow, in which you've got a good reason to believe that the resulting relationship should be linear, you can fit a straight line between your noisy experimental data points, either by eye or algorithmically by minimizing the short red lines using Gaussian least squares. This slide shows four data points, the red crosses. Say they are noisy radar readings of an aircraft altitude. Look what happens if we try to fit different models to this data. If the plane is flying at a constant height, the average value gives the best fit to the data and the best guess of that height. But if it's moving at a constant velocity, then we can fit a straight line which shows the plane to be climbing. Having started with a constant and then a straight line, the next higher order polynomial we could try is a quadratic, but in this case it doesn't differ too much from the straight line. However, going a further one up to a cubic polynomial, this is wiggly enough to fit all our four data points exactly. Uncomfortable for any passengers and hopefully not the actual aircraft motion. We want to best merge our airplane model to the noisy data and unless it's a stunt plane, the straight line or quadratic will give the best estimate. In practice, an aircraft or a robot will have a known dynamic model, which we can then fit to any incoming data. Don't panic, the sums can come later. This slide just gives a flavour of one form of the algorithm. It performs a real-time, least square error fit of the robot motion model to incoming sensor data. In this form, the prediction part is simply the model of the motion x pointy hat at time step k based on measurements up to the previous time step k minus 1. The noisy altitude measurement y at time k is then compared with the prediction and the two blended together with a gain matrix to form a best guess of the actual position. The gain matrix mixes the model and the measurement in accordance with the confidence held in both. If the radar measurements are very noisy, the gain is low and the filter would tend to follow the model. But if the model predictions are uncertain, maybe because the aircraft is a stunt plane, the gain will be set high and the filter will follow the measurements more closely. This slide shows some results in the case where the yellow measurements are very noisy and we can see how the filter uses the dynamics of the model to get a low pass estimate which is pretty close to the actual unknown position shown here in purple. The probabilistic approach incorporates noisy sensor readings into robot models using Bayesian filters like this. Instead of a fixed point, the robot position is represented by a probability distribution with a maximum belief in the position at the mean value. If the robot is commanded to move, the drive signals for the motors, wheel odometry and so on can be used with the model of the robot motion to predict its new position. However, the uncertainties in its predicted position will increase with the distance moved, the effect of lowering the belief and spreading the range of possibilities. Now the noisy sensor position measurement can be combined with this estimate to produce a more confident representation of the final position. However, 
Analytical techniques like this inevitably become more difficult as the complexity of the situation increases. And assumptions of linearity, sequential processing and precision meet real-world non-linearities, parallelism and uncertainty. This slide shows a transition from simple feedback controls of speed, say, which are easily implemented using analytical methods, up through more complex tasks such as steering through traffic, navigating from A to B, and finally managing a transport system, which require a different approach. Precision gives way to flexibility, adaption and learning. So artificial intelligence approaches become important as these are inherently nonlinear, parallel, imprecise and adaptive. This isn't just true for navigation, but also for human interaction, or anywhere that robots have to cope with a messy and uncertain surface of reality rather than any underlying simplicity. This slide shows some AI techniques commonly used in robotics. Fuzzy logic is essentially logic with continuous values for truth between naught, I don't believe it, and one, I'm sure which incidentally gets around a few logical paradoxes like Sorites. It can be used to generate linguistic rules useful for control type tasks. Neural networks imitate brain functions with simplified models of neurons that can be trained to recognize faces or fingerprints or speech say. Evolutionary algorithms imitate Darwinian evolution to solve optimization problems like finding a best route or learning how to fly. Stanley won the recent $2 million DARPA challenge for an autonomous guided vehicle to complete a 140-mile route across the Mojave Desert. Among the strategies it used were algorithms including an unscented Kalman filter for data fusion, along with artificial intelligence techniques for learning human driver responses to difficult sensing situations. This video shows Stanley en route. Here, overtaking a slower competitor, including a robot's eye view of a robot-robot interaction, and then negotiating a mountain pass. It seems highly likely that successors to Stanley will be driving around on our roads in the not-too-distant future. Staggering on then to the problem of robot walking. This is an important but quite tricky issue for androids, being essentially a form of controlled falling over that takes even well-adapted humans a year or so to master. The traditional approach is to form a mathematical model, perhaps starting with the linked elements and joints as shown here, giving a six-state model of joint angle and body position. And this can be used to develop a control strategy to stabilize around a zero motion point and then to move in the desired way. An alternative AI approach to this problem is to use evolutionary algorithms. Here, each joint has a set of four numbers that represents an operation to compute the next angle to drive the joint to, based on the current angles of the other joints. These numbers are initially randomized so that each joint will produce an arbitrary motion which depends on other joint positions. A very large number of trials with different random settings are then run in simulation or experimentally. The most successful outcomes, as weighed by a fitness function that rewards distance travelled and how upright the body is, are used for the breeding stock of the next generation of trials. Many, many, many fallings over and many generations later, with luck, it might just work. It took humans millions of years too. Issues, however, do arise. Just how it works, for example, may not be immediately obvious, and it may well be that a particular program may later prove to be an evolutionary dead end in terms of changing requirements, but it's certainly a viable alternative and often an improvement on the conventional approach. Japanese companies like Honda and Sony have developed some remarkable walking robots, including Curio, who can run and jump, and Asimo here, who can negotiate stairs. Well, back to Replier and the Grand Imitation of Life project. 
Already, some things are becoming noticeable. One is that computers have already been programmed to play chess, perform medical diagnoses, and most distressingly, compose music in the style of Bach and Mozart at a level to fool the experts. However, paradoxically, it's the commonplace and common sense that's the most elusive and challenging. Asking your house robot to find your car keys you think you left on the kitchen table will take a lot more work. And that's the imitation that seems to be the hardest to achieve. Replier is the future, the imitation of human life. What it's used for, as a slave, helper or destroyer, will depend on our development as much as hers. But if my original suggestion has any merit, then robots may be the ones to give us the understanding of the human condition required for us to behave better than we do now.